Hello everybody. Today I wanted to go over ChemNotes 4.3, um, talking about essentially the electron and how it is arranged in an atom. So first of all, we have what's called the Bohr model. It's been around for over a hundred years and it's a very simplified uh, model of the atom. It's not totally correct, but we still use it for talking about energies of an electron. And uh, it's a good place to start. So, if we look at our notes, PowerPoint, we have uh, right here is a Bohr model. You got circle and then a bigger circle and a bigger circle. And each circle represents an energy level that uh, electrons are found in. And it's, another name is kind of like the orbital, uh, the, the planetary model, kind of like electrons acting like a planet moving around the central nucleus. So the, uh, the model that we're going to uh, talk about uh, in a little bit is um, more of the current model. It's the electron cloud model. And uh, it's where basically electrons are found in zones of probability of where they might possibly be because we can't determine the exact location of an electron at any given point in time, just its probable location. All right, but... Um, Moving on, oh, where did it go? Looking at the uh, uh, quantum theory, we have um, energy levels and we have sublevels. All right, so energy levels are um, areas where electrons can be found, is how far from the nucleus. So N equals 1, energy level 1, is closest to the nucleus, lowest energy. Number 2, a little bit more energy further from the nucleus. And as you go out, it gets further from the nucleus and higher energy. But if we start talking about sublevels, also known as orbitals, these are um, different shapes of uh, probability of where these electrons can be found, also called electron clouds. Uh, and we have uh, different types of shapes. There's the S, P, D, and then F, which we're not gonna really get into in this class. All right, so moving down. Oh, um, we do wanna talk about Heisenberg. So I did mention it earlier, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is essentially saying you scientists cannot determine the exact specific location of an electron at any given time, only these zones of probability. So an example would be you are at Oconomowoc High School in Mr. Hebner's classroom, room 338. Your parents may not know uh, where room 338 is. Uh, they do know where the high school is, and they know that you're somewhere at the high school. Same thing with scientists. We know that uh, a specific electron is somewhere in the s orbital, for example. Uh, where it is in that s orbital, we're not sure, but it's somewhere there. And that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. All right. Um, we're not going to get into uh, quantum numbers right now, so that's more for AP or IB chem. But uh, talking about the shapes of these suborbitals found in these energy levels, the s orbital is a spherical shape. So that means if an electron is, an, is in an s orbital, it is found somewhere within this sphere. Um, if you need to pause the video, you can pause it to write down these notes. Notice how I have 1s and 2s. So the 1 represents how close to the nucleus it is. If it's 2, it's further. If it's 3, it's even further. Notice how the spheres, or the zones of probability of 1s, is smaller than the zone of probability for 2s. So the further from the nucleus, or the higher the energy level, the bigger the suborbital shape. All right, then we've got the p orbital. So the p orbital is kind of like a uh, dumbbell or a mustache. And the thing about the p orbital is there are three different p orbitals. One's going up and down, one left to right, and one in and out and they are three-dimensional. All right, moving on to the d orbital. 
The D orbital is more like a flower petal. You got one, two, three, four different nodes. And there are one, two, three, four, five different D orbital shapes. Uh, you call them a suborbital. And these are the five different shapes. And there is the um, F orbital, but it's beyond this course. We're not going to get into it. Now would be a really good time to watch the video that is showing the scandium atom and all of the electrons and the zones of probability or the orbitals uh, that make it up in which those electrons are found in. And um, I posted it, but also uh, here it is. Uh, so definitely uh, pause, watch that video, and I'll uh, see you in a couple minutes. All right, I hope you enjoyed that video. I know I did. Um, let's move on. Here we go. Here's, oh, I forgot one thing. The uh, poly exclusion principle and Huhn's rule, I believe it's, is it on here? Yeah, why don't we talk about those two first? We got poly exclusion principle and the off bow principle. So I would write these down. All right, the poly exclusion principle states that uh, each suborbital can have a max of two electrons only. So something I did not mention earlier and should have um, was an s orbital has only one suborbital, and we usually we represent it with a box or a um, circle. And why don't I get this on here? Let's just write it down. We got s orbital. We're going to represent it by one circle and it has a max of two electrons. There we go. Next is the p orbital. And actually it has a uh, one sub orbital. The s orbital. All right, p orbital is represented by three circles. Oh, sorry, I'm messing it up. I'm, I'm confusing the uh, orbital filling diagram. So the s orbital is a circle. The p orbital is the three bow ties. And they overlay each other. Uh, and you represent the bow ties with a circle. Or if you're doing AP chemistry, you do the boxes. Um, both work. So uh, if each suborbital can have a max of two electrons, and according to the poly exclusion principle, they need to have opposite spins, meaning one is going clockwise and the other is going counterclockwise. So therefore, they only meet twice in every rotation, which satisfies the lowest energy. And they want to go uh, follow the path of least resistance. So by going in opposite directions, they see each other the least amount of time, which is good because they're both negatively charged electrons and they repel. So they, they don't want to see each other. And uh, each suborbital has a max of two electrons. But the p orbital has three suborbitals, three little bow tie shapes that are overlaid on top of each other. So then we would have a max of two, four, six electrons. And we have. Um, one, two, three suborbitals. Yeah, three suborbitals. Moving on to the D. This is the flower petal. And again, there's four of them. And the fifth one is this weird dumbbell going through a donut. So how we got here is there's one, two, three, four, five suborbitals. So I'm going to have five circles, or if I'm doing the boxes, one, two, three, four, five. And therefore I'd have two, four, six, eight, ten electrons would be the max. Could I have less than ten? Yes, but I cannot have more than ten. There's not enough space. And the number is five, one, two, three, four, five suborbitals. Just for fun, following the pattern, if I'm going to F, we don't have to worry about the shape. But 
how many suborbitals would f have? If I have 1 in the s, 3 in the p, 5 in the d, what's my pattern? If you need to pause and think, you can do that this time. All right. If you haven't gotten it, <coughs> the pattern is increasing by 2. So 1, 3, 5. So we would have 7 as the next. 4, 5, 6, 7, which means we'd have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 would be the max number of electrons in our seven suborbitals. All right, moving on, going to the Aufbau principle. Aufbau is German for building up. It means you have to start close to the nucleus with adding your electrons before you can add them to the outermost. Um, so, for example, electrons are going to be close to the nucleus as opposed to being far away from the nucleus. They're not going to be far away. That takes too much energy. They're naturally going to be close to the nucleus. So that's the off-ball principle. So you got to start adding your electrons close to the nucleus, and then you can build them up going out. And that's foundational to electron configuration. All right, going back, I've got this picture of a periodic table, and it's structured so that elements of the same type of valence electrons are arranged in columns, and that's valence is outermost electrons. So elements in column 1 and 2 these elements all have their outer electrons found in the s orbital shape. These transition metals all have their outer electrons found in the d. The p section, these elements all have their outer electrons found in the p orbital. And when I'm talking about outer electrons, it's kind of easiest to think of it in terms of the Bohr model. So we got one, two, three, one, two, three. When talking about valence electrons, say I got two in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two. So in my outer ring, I've got two electrons. Therefore, I've got two valence electrons. So that's what they're talking about when we're saying valence electrons. Anyways, when we're talking about electron configuration, this periodic table is something you're going to want to memorize the patterns. First two columns are going to be S, the middle is D, the last six columns are P, and the bottom two rows are F. All right, for example, let's move on here. Um, Let's do something simpler, and I'm going to have this periodic table here. Let me fix it. All right, so why don't we do, let's do a simple one, like um, helium. So here's helium, and according to off power principle, I have to start at the first, um, first electron, which is right up here. And this is in the first row, so I'm going to write 1. And it's in the S section, so I'm going to write 1S. And then how many electrons does helium have? Well, it has 1, 2 electrons. So I would write 1S2. And if we look at our notes earlier, the uh, S orbital has a max of 2 electrons, so that works. You might say, well, why is it green? Like, the P's are all green. Well, it's an exception. So this helium should be over lumped here with the uh, S's. So let's do another one, a little bit harder. Let's do carbon. And carbon, you can't really see it on this periodic table, but um, if you count, here's one, two, three, four, five, six. I know carbon's right there. If you don't believe me, let's go to the periodic table. And it's loading. Here we go. Carbon. It has atomic number 6, which means it has 6 electrons in its balanced form. 
All right, and uh, we got to start at hydrogen. It's in the first row, so we're going to write 1. And if we look at our periodic table here, this is in the S section, so we call it S. And there are 1, 2 of them. All right, so I'm going to write 1S, 2, just like the electron configuration of helium. All right, change the screen a little bit, make it a little less clunky. So I got 1s2, and now I'm over by where it's lithium and beryllium. So this is in the second row, and it's in the s section. So I'm going to write second s. But how many electrons are there? One, two, three, four. There's four left until I get to carbon. But s can only have a max of two electrons. If we look at our notes, s orbital, max of two electrons. So it's like a bucket that's filled up. So that means we're going to have to go on to the next bucket, which in this case is aluminum. No, it's not aluminum. I'm blanking. Boron. Boron and carbon are the next ones. And uh, this is still in the second row, but now it's the P section. So we're going to call it 2P, and there's one, two of them. So it's going to be 2P2. And that's carbon, the electron configuration, 1S2, 2S2, 2P2. All right, let's do an element that's a little bit more difficult, but not too difficult. Let's find something like aluminum, number 13. All right. So I'm going to write down aluminum. And I have to start again at hydrogen. It's in the first row, and it's in the S section. So we're going to call it 1S2. 1, 2, because I maxed out, S can only have 2. And so I continue on. Second row, S section, 2S2. And I can't make it 2S3 because 2, or S, again, has a max of two electrons only. So if I max it out, then I got to go to the next orbital or the next bucket. And it's still in the second row, but now it's the P section. Remember, aluminum is down here. So it's 2P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm going to write 2p6. And if we look at our notes, remember, p orbital has a max of six electrons. Can't have seven. If it has seven, then you got to continue on to the next orbital, which is what we're going to have to do because we haven't gotten to our full 13 yet. All right, moving on. I'm in the third row now, and it's in the s section. So we call this... 3s, 1, 2. And then we're continuing on to the last one, is third row P section 1. So we call it 3p1, and we have our electron configuration for aluminum. All right, let's do something a little bit more difficult, like one that's in the, uh, the D orbital range. So let's pick a good one. Um, where is it? Here it is. Um, iron seems to be a fun one. Ooh, and then this one we can talk, oh no, we'll, we'll talk about Hoon's rule and orbital filling diagrams in a later video. So let's just do like a, the electron configuration for iron. Key 26. That's how many electrons. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 into the d orbital. All right, let's get going with this. Iron, if we look at it, we got to start at hydrogen again. So 1s2, 1s2, 2s2, 1s2, 2s. You can see the pattern. It, it's it's going to be the same, essentially, as aluminum was, but you're continuing on. So we got hydrogen is 1s, 1, 2. We go on to the second row in the S section, 2S, 1, 2. 
and we continue on 2p 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we're in the third row, 3s, 1, 2. Oops, 3s, 2. And then we've got 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3p, 6. And then we continue on to the fourth row and see S section, 4S, 1, 2. And then we get to the D section. Notice how the D, it's one less than the row it's in. It's in the fourth row, but we call it 3D. This is in the fifth row, but we call it 4D. Sixth row, we call it 5D. So Ds are always one less than the row they're in. And uh, if you're curious, it has to do with there being more electrons in the d orbital, therefore a greater, a greater electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the electrons, which kind of draws those d electrons in just slightly closer, causing it to be in an energy level a little bit lower than the s. All right, so then we continue on. It's not 4d, it's going to be 3d, and we call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because that's where iron is. It is the sixth one in. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to call it 3D six. And that's the electron configuration of iron, a transition metal, a D element, a D, yeah, a D orbital uh, element. All right, we're going to do one last thing, and that's noble gas shorthand. Remember the noble gases are this Column 18, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon are noble gases. They're called noble because they have eight outer electrons, which is a, the most stable conformation. Every element wants to have eight outer electrons, and no, noble gases have that, which uh, is perfect. So we're going to use those as a standard to uh, base our electron configuration and shorten it. So for, well, for helium, we can't really do a uh, shorthand because... It's already so short. It's 1s2. But what about carbon? Could we shorten carbon up? Well, yeah, we could. Instead of writing 1s2, we could write helium, which doesn't really shorten it up a whole lot, but we'll do it for example's sake. We got, sorry, I put it right there. Put helium. Oh my gosh. Helium. There it is. And helium's electron configuration is 1s2. So now we just continue and write our 2s2, 2p2. And if we are utilizing this, we got heliums right here. So then we continue 2s2, 2p2, and there's our carbon. All right, why don't we do, what was the other one we did? I think it was aluminum. Yes, aluminum. All right, aluminum is right here, number 13. Don't believe me? There it is, number 13. Which noble gas comes before 13? Is it argon, number 18, or neon, number 10? That's right, it's neon, number 10. So you're going to write neon in brackets. That's our noble gas. And if we look at it, neon is right here, so that covers... 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. All right. So all of these I don't have to write. I'm going to continue on after neon to 3s2, 3p1, which is what I got right here, 3s2, 3p1. 3s2, 3p1. And I have my noble gas shorthand for aluminum. Now let's do iron. So iron is element number 26 looking at it it's right here number 26 comes after which noble gas looks like argon number 18 so i'm going to write argon in brackets argon in brackets and looking at that Oh, uh, speaking of argon, anybody know uh, why there aren't that many good chemistry jokes? 
because all the good ones are gone. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, all right, argon is right over here. So that covers us all the way through 3P6. All right, where's 3P6? There it is. There we go. So that is my argon, which leaves me with 4S2, 3P, 3D6. Argon, 4S2, 3P, 3D6. And that is how you do NOLA gas shorthand for electron configuration. All right, that's my video. It's long enough. Hope you have a great rest of your day, evening, or morning. Have a good one.